you have every right to control something that's completely organic to you, your identity. So let's say you wake up one beautiful morning, get your coffee, your tea, and drive your nice car to work, and you park your car in the parking lot. The parking lot owner decides to rent your car out to someone unknown, who then takes your car on a joyride. You come back in the evening just to find your car, and what you find is stains of ice cream, trash, and smell of sweat inside your car. How does that make you feel? That is what is happening with your data today. So now let's say the next day, the parking lot owner decides to rent your car out again, but this time, the stranger manages to lose your car. It's gone. And they come back to kindly inform you that they have lost your nice car and leave you to deal with this lovely mess. That is what happened when Target, Equifax, Facebook, and Marriott lost your data. Now let's say, next day, your colleague at work who heard your story said, this is way too dangerous, I will not drive my car anymore. Fair enough, reasonable response, except that we now live in a convenience economy. It's like saying, I will not participate in this digital economy in any way. Everything, from your groceries delivered to your door, to your online purchasing history, to something as simple as your free email account, these are all windows to our identity, behavior, and even ideological preferences that these companies mine and then sell. So how good of fiduciaries are these companies as keepers of such data? Check this out. If you participated in the recent 10-year aging challenge, hmm, you have then given them vital facial recognition data about you easily that they can easily sell. See, that is how this data economy works, and it works for companies you could think of. Our data is sold without our knowledge or consent. Now they have so much data harvested about us that they have built these walled gardens of data with moats around them that other companies cannot compete with those assets. From the benign, noble origins of the internet in the 90s, we have now created a few hungry beasts. And these beasts must be kept fed. Well, it wasn't like this always. Remember the time when we humans used to live in tribes back in the day? Everyone knew everyone. Everyone knew everybody's business. By the way, it's still like that when I go back to some small towns in India. You know, if I want to buy a pair of jeans, my grandmother would tell me about an aunt who had a nephew who had a shop in the town square. Has that happened to you? She would tell me to go there and nowhere else. So we had this inherent, implicit mechanism of trust based on people-to-people -people connection. We tried to replicate that trust in the digitally connected world. And then these governments, companies, and organizations became brokers to such trust. Yet that model is under threat today. Some companies have figured out how to exploit the data economy by offering us services that we seemingly enjoy without respecting an individual's right to data privacy. See, I argue that an individual's right to digital identity data is a fundamental human right. All technology that we create in this day and age must reflect that right. In fact, organizations like ID2020, W3C, People-Centered Internet, Rebooting Web of Trust, they're all working towards that goal already. So if you think about it, our identity is central to our existence. Our digital identity shapes our non-digital real-life experiences and the other way around. Imagine this. God forbid, if you ever became a refugee, being a country torn by war or political or economic strife. Your identity is all you have to claim all that you have. So how did we respond to this issue? Well, the European Union passed the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, in 2016. Similar regulations were enacted in South Africa, South Korea, Japan, Brazil, Canada, and here in the United States, in California. 
That is a regulatory mandated response. Most companies that are required to be compliant with GDPR are still not compliant and have asked for extensions to do so. Consider this. Some of us here are entrepreneurs and leaders in companies. Where the goal is to create successful products and profits. So what we observe here interestingly is this natural tension between an individual's right to data privacy and a society's warranted need for business and commerce. Is there a way for us to bring all these actors together? Is there a way for us to balance everyone's needs? I believe there is. All right, so what we are about to explore next is a technology that you've heard about, ad nauseum. Bitcoin, Ethereum, cryptocurrencies, yeah? Yes, I am talking about blockchain. Blockchain is the underlying technology for all these cryptocurrencies that you hear about. Blockchain is also much more hyped and much less understood. Turns out, in all of this noise, it has some use for us over here. So, let's play with some bricks, shall we? This is a brick or a block. So think of your identity data, like your name, email address, phone number, etc., as part of this one smiley face. <laughs> now this block holds this identity data for four people. Okay, now let's connect this block to the next block. And as we do, let's add something interesting. Let's add a timestamp. Every time a block is connected to the next block, we add a timestamp that gives us a historical record. Okay. Now, let's take the mathematical representation of the contents of this top block and create a fingerprint out of it. And then let's store that fingerprint onto the next block in the way that these two blocks are now connected. Okay. Now, let's add something even more fun. Let's add an address. This address is like a P.O. box you can send stuff to. But the contents of this P.O. box are encrypted. You couldn't read what's inside of it unless you had a key. So if Jim wanted her friend Erica to have access to identity data, he could just send her the address and a key. Okay, moving on. Now let's keep con connecting these blocks and to store them we don't store them in one central place, as was the case with companies storing your data centrally. We distribute them, like spreading your eggs in multiple baskets, and we store them in multiple computers. Doing so removes the single point of failure and makes this chain of blocks more secure and tamper-proof. And none of these computers, by the way, are owned by any single entity or company. Okay, now let's add another significant aspect. Let's say every time an identity is added to a block and a block then is added to the next block, it's considered to be immutable. It cannot be changed, altered, or removed. So say hello to your immutable self. As you think about what could be included in identity, let's raise the stakes here. Let's think about something that we all have, but is distinct in all of us, something that makes us who we are. It's the pattern of your iris, the print of your fingers, the tone of your voice, essentially your biometric data. And now let's raise the stakes here further. Think of something that is so central and core to who we are. Yes, your DNA, your actual DNA data. Now picture the consequences when then with that data falls into the wrong hands. As Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the World Wide Web said recently, the internet must become more people-centric. So wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where we have agency over our own data? Something like this. Let's say you applied for a mortgage for a house across town. Now, the mortgage company wants your identity data, fair enough. 
Now that you have your digital identity data in one place, you have access. You are then able to share specific detail with the company you have consent for the purposes of receiving a mortgage for a limited period of time, let's say three months, you have control, and only revealing the details that need to be revealed. For instance, if your age is asked for, your specific date of birth need not be revealed. Minimalization. And the mortgage company should tell you what they know about you already. Sounds good? Here's a twist. Let's say in a month's time, you find a sailboat. You fall in love with a human, not with a sailboat. <laughs> and you decide to live in Bahamas with your beloved, and you don't want that house anymore. At that moment in time, you should be able to revoke consent to the use of your data for any purpose, regardless of how it was acquired. And the mortgage company should have consequences if that consent is ever breached. See, this is what Christopher Allen referred to as self-sovereign identity. And a blockchain-enabled ecosystem could achieve that. Look, these issues may seem complex, and this technology is constantly evolving. I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to be agents of change. As technologists, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, social leaders, business leaders, marketers, storytellers, lawyers, we too can reboot this web of trust, perhaps in the same way like our ancestors did. If we care about the ownership of our own digital identity, we must solve for it collectively because it affects each one of us individually. You have every right to control something that's completely organic to you, your identity. You do. Thank you.